Well, I'm excited to be back. I heard the announcements. Didn't she do a great job, by the way? Avery, good job, Avery. Thank you, thank you, thank you, girl. Uh, and I thought she said something that when I was like in high school and college, I would go, yeah, they're all, they always say that. They're supposed to say that. What else are they going to say? They said, you know, volunteers around here, staff are awesome. And I thought, actually, that's the truth here at our church. I actually believe that. That's not hyperbole. Our, our staff and our congregation and, and servers are awesome. They really are. Hey, give them a big hand and thank God for them. Uh, so you're going to have to bear with me today. We're supposed to be in 1 John. Not really, but that's where we left off. But I wanted to have kind of introductory message to get us back into the flow of things. And then next week we'll be in 1 John. Then the week after that we'll have Officer Tatum here. So that's going to be pretty awesome. It's going to be really great. We tried to get the Edison Bowl. They wouldn't let us go in there. And so we're going to have three overly populated services here. We're going to have a big uh, Labor Day picnic and everything, but we're going to have to adjust because we're limited to our facility here. I'll give you more information on that in a minute. But today, I wanted to have a kind of like a comeback sermon, kind of an introduction as I get back into the uh, church family, begin to rub elbows and schmooze with everybody, begin to spend some time with the staff and the congregation. And so I was praying about and thinking about and really kind of having, uh, uh, how would I explain that, uh, conflict in my mind over whether I should go into 1 John or to do this. And as I had prayed about it and contemplated and talked about it uh, with our head chief of staff, Marissa, we thought, you know, I think this is probably the dire direction we're going to go. It's going to be a little different today. It's going to be very similar. It's, we're going to preach, but we're going to cover a lot of territory in the preaching too. You, you okay with that? A lot of Bible territory. And the reason that I want to do this today is because uh, I think that we're in a time of crisis in our country. And I think it would be a little bit odd of me to come back and pretend nothing happened in the last six weeks, which has felt like six years in terms of history in the nation. And so I think I need to address that as a conscientious and a responsible pastor. So the title of today's message is God's Assurances in the Midst of a National Crisis. And it's based on Psalm 37, verses 1 through 40. Did I tell you we're going to take a lot of, game, a lot of territory? I'm looking at people who have no faith. <laughs> you don't think we're getting through 40 verses, do you? Well, we're going to have a casual, expositional stroll through the entire passage covering all the verses, and we won't be here tomorrow in one service. We'll be in two services tomorrow, right? Does that sound good? And so I want to start by saying this, and that is that we live in a very unique time in our nation's history. Historians call this time the fourth turning. There are two historians, one from Harvard and Yale, they teamed up and they found that in Western civilization in the last 500 years, there are these major turnings of events and they tend to pattern themselves every 80 to 100 years and they, each one of those 80 to 100 years have 20 to 25 year cy uh, cycles or, or time periods within that. So there are four different segments that make up the 80 to 100 years and each one of these segments have characteristics about them. And the fourth turning refers to the fourth segment of that 100-year or 80 to 100-year period. Does that make sense? And so the first, okay, the first cycle, all right, is the arts and the explosion and all that. And the fourth cycle is revolution. The third cycle is the awakening. So if you go into American history, which is a part of Western civilization's history, you'll find that when Charles Wesley... And, and John Edwards and George Whitfield were preaching the gospel in the United States. They led to the first what? Great. Anyone know your history? Awakening. Awakening. And that was the third segment, segment of that turning. The fourth se segment was the American Revolution. And that ended, let's say, approximately 1780. Okay. 1776 started the battle, the Declaration of Independence, and then it was an eight-year war. It went from 76 to 84. We'll call it 1980. So what is 80 years further? So that was the first fourth turning. We lost 85,000 soldiers, it looks like, in that war. It wasn't a big country. It wasn't a lot of people here in the United States at that time. You go 80 years forward, that's 1860. What happened in 1860? Does anybody know? It was a civil war. So the second fourth turning in American history was the civil war, a civil revolution, if you will. And how many people did we lose in that war? 635,000 people. 
That's a lot. It's more than any other war we've ever fought, and as a percentage of the population, it would be equivalent to learning, losing about 35 million Americans today. That's a lot of people. Okay? That's how much it devastated the country. And that was another revolution. And it was what? What preceded it? The Second Great Awakening and the abolitionist movement by Christians. Solid, hardcore, biblical Christians say we don't enslave people around here anymore. We're willing to go to war over it. Then you go 80 years forward. What do you have from 60? You're in 1940. What happened in 1940? There's a world war. And what was this? What was the awakening before the world war? There was the, what is known as the fundamentalist movement, 1910 to 1917. A group of millionaires in Los Angeles, California, brought forth a guy by the name of R.A. Torrey and founded, what is it called? Biola, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles in downtown Los Angeles by two giant Christian oil magnets. And what did they say? That the theology coming out of Europe, and particularly Germany, is, is nihil nihilistic and atheistic, and they're attacking the fundamentals of the Christian faith. If you will come out here from Moody Bible Institute and start the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, we will pay for the building, we'll pay for you, we'll pay for your staff, but you have to fight this attack on the fundamental faith of Christianity. And so they issued four volumes, I have it on my uh, shelves in my library, called The Fundamentals. And it's a re-articulation of the, of the faith of believing in the scriptures as the word of God and binding and true and reliable and the only source of the gospel message that leads to eternal life. And that began the fundamentalist movement. That was the awakening. But then we have what? The murder of people who abandoned that in Germany, who were Lutherans, and they killed 12 million people, 6 million Jews, and 6 million non-Jews. As well as what's happening with Stalin in the 40s, he's killing his own people. We don't know how many because he just buried in mass graves. The estimate is anywhere between 25 and 50 million people. And then you have China under Mao that is now attacking and targeting individual Christians, especially, but all kinds of people. And we know by the time he was done, he killed over 65 million people in some of his bureaucratic decisions. And we don't even know how many others because once again they just disappear well then you go 80 years forward from there and where are you 2020 and what happened in 2020 well as of the 15th of this month over 1 million people died from COVID there is clearly a fourth turning taking place historians are admitting it's taking place and when you have these great fourth turnings things happen and these major turnings are characterized by conflict, by confusion, by disillusionment, by societal upheaval, by rage, by fear, by anxiety, and by a general feeling of social agitation. They are harbingers of revolution. I am not arguing for a revolution. I'm arguing for a great awakening. <laughs> I want to avoid the revolution. But things are moving along this. I need some water. This stuff is getting to my mouth. I can't. I'm going to lose my voice. My tongue is swelling up right now. So uh, maybe I'm just fired up. But nonetheless, we are in this fourth turning. People are kind of seeing it, admitting it. The, the uh, intellectuals are talking about it. They understand it. Does anybody know who Chris Rufo is? Okay, let's try this. Anyone know who Governor DeSantis is? Okay, so you see all the policy he does? There's always a guy about six foot two, six foot three, standing on the left behind him. That's Christopher Rufo. He is a conservative, he's a Christian, and he's an intellectual. He's the guy that discovered that Sacramento was insinuating these Aztec worship chants into our children's elementary curriculum and blew the whistle on him. He's not liked by him at all. And so DeSantis constantly consults him for what the adjustments need to be made to bring our country, and, or at least the state of Florida, back into alignment with the founding principles of our nation, Christopher Rufo. Well, he's done a three-part series on what's going on in America today entitled America's Cultural Revolution. And this is what he says. He, this came out a month ago. America is in a state of revolution, and it's not the kind of revolution with competing armies and a, a coup d'etat. It's an invisible revolution along the axis of race, gender, and identity, and it's shaking our country down to its foundations. It is something that you can probably feel or see or hear in your daily life. 
When you go to work, you look in your child's backpack and you find material you think is inappropriate and inconsistent with the virtues you're trying to develop in your child, especially concerning sex and gender fluidity. You read the news headlines and you know that something has gone horribly wrong. Within our elite institutions, you know that some of the things that you're seeing, even in your local experience, violate some of your most deeply held principles and values. It seems like wherever you look, there's critical race theory, critical gender theory, and I would add critical uh, queer theory, which according to Dr. James uh, Lindsay is, get this, 20 times worse. Let me say it again, 20 times worse. 20 times worse. I have a whole thing. I'm probably going to have to do a podcast on this. This stuff is ugly and vicious and destructive on a level you cannot imagine. Queer theory. It is unbelievably evil. And these drag queen story hours are all part of sucking kids into it and destroying lives. It is really. And this is in their own words. And their own academic papers that they have said this is the goal of it. It's not like I'm a conspiracy theorist. They've actually published papers saying this is the real goal. And I'll share those when I do the podcast on that. They're making new inroads into the institutions that matter to you. These deep problems, we are going up against entrenched interests whose entire livelihood depends on this feather-bedded bureaucracy that promotes the critical theories that have been and continue to be immune to public checks and balances for the past few decades. Astute observers of history have seen over and over and over That when ideology takes absolute control over bureaucratic and administrative power, it wins. These are deep problems. But in our case, it's not too late. Yet, it will require fundamental action. And that's what I want to talk about today. What is the Christian response to what's going on in the culture that would be approved of God? Well... In Psalm 11, verse 3, the Bible says, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? This is a problem that has existed in a long time. And so that's why we're here today. I want to talk about the four assurances that God gives to his people when their nation is in chaos and crisis. So let's pray. And we're going to look at this Psalm 37, which addresses that issue. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we can be together. It's great to be back with the church family. I'm excited to be Uh, here today. But Lord, I don't want to say anything that's inaccurate or inappropriate. So I pray that you would enlighten my minds and my understanding and my ability to communicate effectively the truth, both of your word and of the situation as exists in our culture today. And that as a result of being here together, we would be inspired with hope and encouragement and also know what we need to do to make the difference for your glory and for our good. We pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. In Psalm 34, God gives us four encouraging assurances, and it's for those who are stressed out and concerned about the current state of the nation. Verse 25 is the key verse in the entire psalm, and the reason I say this is because David wrote this psalm, and he says, I was young, and now I'm old. And when you study the scholars reading of Psalm 37, they say, why does David write this song? It's an acrostic song, so every single sentence starts with the alphabet letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it's Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth. That's how each line starts, right? Through the entire Hebrew al- alphabet. Because David is known for writing praise songs in the Psalms. He writes praise stuff. There is no words of direct praise to God in this Psalm. It's the only song that David wrote that doesn't have that element. To it. Almost all of them say, so praise Yahweh. Give, you know, shout to the Lord. You know, things like that. In here, he doesn't do that. It's an instructional song. It's a song that gives directives to people. It almost reads like wisdom literature, like Proverbs, and things like, or Ecclesiastes. David was not known for this kind of writing, so there's a lot of debate about what's going on. Well, he tells us in verse 25, like I said, that he was an old guy. He's looking back on his life. If he's an old guy, he's looking back on his life, what's next? Death. And what does he see as a wise king who's lived a very checkered life (laughs) but loved God? He says, well, 10 years ago, my son Absalom tried to kill me. He took all my wives on the top of of the castle and he raped them publicly to demonstrate that he was bringing shame to me and taking over the kingdom. I had to go to war against him. It cost me some of my best friends and generals were dead in that. 
My name was forever tarnished in the kingdom. And now my other children are fighting over the throne. They see I'm tottering. They know the days are limited. And they're going to split this kingdom. There's going to be a fourth turning. There's a crisis on the, on the horizon. And David has the wisdom to see it. So he sits down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and with prophetic vision leaves the nation council on how to navigate the crisis that lies ahead. This would compare to something like Washington's farewell that we would do well to read again today because he was right. Or Eisenhower's farewell, who was also able to see this because he was in the middle of that fourth turning. He had been experienced the previous one, and he's seeing the new one starting to develop. It would be good for us to pay attention. So this is what David is doing. He's giving the nation advice when you're in a, when you're in a situation of great confusion and conflict. And he gives us, I see, four big principles, and then we'll kind of, kind of whittle them down into particulars for all of us. The first one is this, found in the first 11 verses, and that is our Lord can be trusted. Our Lord can be trusted. Let's say that out together. We're, we're, we're Christians, aren't we? Are we Christians? Yes. Good. Ben, can we trust the Lord? Yes. Let's say it together. Our Lord can be trusted. You have to keep that in the forefront of your mind. Because when you lose faith and trust and confidence in God and his ability to do what he's going to talk about that God can do for us, then you're going to abandon God and resort to your own wisdom. And that always leads to what? Failure. Failure. Thank you. Going off the cliff. Right? Right? And so we have to remember that the first thing he says is that our Lord can be trusted. So respond to evil with spiritually strategic action instead of emotional agitation. Because why? How many has been mad? When they see something on the news. And raise your hand if you've been mad. How many like taking off your shoe and throwing it at the TV? How many yelled at the TV? How many yelled at your wife or husband after you, what you saw at the TV and not even know you're yelling? There's some agitation happening. So as Christians, God says, that's not how we deal with it. we got to deal with it differently. We understand. That's why he starts with the first three words, do not fret. <laughs> now, why do you think he says do not fret? Because you fret. When there's chaos all around, when things, there's conflict, there's all kinds of problems going on around you, you fret. And fresh is a, a fret means to be emotionally charged. To be passionate and kind of out of control. It means to be agitated. He says, don't do that when wicked men seem to succeed. So what did you think when the FBI rolled into Mar-a-Lago this last week? Like, I'm not sure I trust the FBI anymore. And other sweet songs were said. This is like out of control. This is too much. What are we doing around here? This is insanity. Right? Right? Well, he says, when wicked men seem to succeed, do not envy evildoers, for they will quickly dry up like grass and wither away like plants. So understand, there's a bigger picture here. So don't get all worked up. Understand, there's a bigger picture. And who's in control of the bigger picture? God is, okay? So what do you do? Verse 3, trust in the Lord. That's what you do. You trust in the Lord. And notice the Lord is all caps. You see that? What does that mean? Yeah. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is our God, right? First commandment. We don't have any other God but that God. That's our God, and we're standing with him 100% all the way. I'm trusting in him. If you lose confidence in him, you've got big trouble. And then he says this, and do what is right. Trust God. Don't get agitated. Don't fret. Just commit yourself to doing what is right. Doing righteousness is what it says. Settle in the land. How many say, I want to move out of California. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> the answer is settle down and stay in the land. Stay, if you stay in the land and you trust God, there are some promise for you that he's going to talk about later in this psalm. Now, it doesn't mean you can't leave California. You're not sinning if you're leaving California. Unless, of course, you get hit by a bolt of lightning. Then we'll know what happened to you. <laughs> but nonetheless... That's not the answer. The answer isn't to run away as a coward. The answer is to stand your ground and trust in the Lord. If he's called you here, this is where you stay, and you need to put your roots down and fight. If he hasn't called you here, then you need to get to wherever he called you. But if he's called you, settle 
in the land. It means to put your roots down. That's what the word means. Settle there. That's where God has you. That's where God wants you. He wants to use you in the crisis. He can't if you run away. That's what he's saying. And maintain your integrity. But don't compromise your integrity. What is integrity? Your integratedness. What does that mean? My beliefs, my values, my virtues, and my Bible are all fully integrated. They're all one and the same. I have a cohesive and coherent worldview that I live out called the Christian worldview. And more people need to adopt that if we're going to get healthy around here. So this adds another level of enthusiasm for evangelism, helping people find Christ and grow by sharing our faith. Most people think it's by sharing our love, but that's not it. That's the byproduct. I'm not trying to share the love of God. I'm trying to share the faith. And I'll use the tool of love to accomplish that. But my goal is not to love people. My goal is to share the faith. If I want to see transformation in the culture and I can't do it if I'm not loving so I'm not saying you shouldn't love but I'm saying don't get the thing you know the cart before the horse understand what the mission is to make disciples of all the nations that's the mission you do that by loving them you do that by loving them so he goes on to say so maintain your integrity make sure that your life is fully integrated that there is no inconsistencies or hypocrisy in the way you live your life when you see things that are going wrong, you have to speak up and say, oh, that's not right. We're not doing that here. Or you can go into a full articulate explanation of what you believe if you're capable of doing that. You may not be, but you don't have to be. You just have to say, nope, not me. Count me out. Not doing that. And then you're standing up for righteousness. Verse 4. Then, here's the promise, you will take delight in the Lord. In other words, you start living this way, you put your roots down, you say, I'm with you, Lord, I'm trusting you, you'll find that God becomes more precious to you. That you delight in that relationship that you have with God. Because he's giving you the strength, the wisdom, the courage, the understanding, and the necessary energy to face the conflict and the crisis that's in the country. That is affecting you, your family, and your community, and your church. And then what happens, he says, and he will answer your prayers. Your prayer life will light on fire when you start living like this instead of cowering, shutting up, putting your head down, pretending like you didn't see that, and saying nothing. God wants you to be a what? Light. Not under the, bris not under the, the bushel basket. Not hiding out in your... Man room with 15 video game screens going at the same time. He wants you shining as a light in the community. He says, commit your future to the Lord. Commit your future to the Lord. Uh, this word commit is beautiful. It's, a, it's hard to translate, but you know what it means? To roll your pack onto the back of another. So all the conflict, all the stress, all the chaos that you're experiencing, take that and roll it onto the back of who? The Lord. And for us, it, which part of, the, of Yahweh? The Son. Come unto me, all you are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. In other words, load it up on me. Partnership with me. First Peter quotes this passage. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. That's the translation. Peter references this verse in First Peter. He's saying this is what you need to do when you're facing these times that are taxing and care draining. He says, take that future of yours that you're concerned about and lay it off onto the back of Jesus, to your future, to the Lord, Yahweh. Trust in him and he will act on your behalf. Either you can act or you can trust the Lord to act. Who do you want to fight the bully? You or Jesus. Jesus? I think Jesus. Remember, I told you almost every time I ask the question in church, who? And it's almost always Jesus. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole point. You can partnership with the Lord and let him take the heavy weight. That's what he's saying. Verse 6, he will vindicate you in broad daylight. Everyone eventually will see. I love this verse. Can I brag just for a second? Do you mind? I don't like bragging too much, especially in the pulpit, but today calls for it. 
The CDC has agreed with everything I said and was criticized about when I opened the church a year and a half ago. Every single thing I said that was true was true. They finally admitted it. Ah, we got it wrong. Ugh. So we need more power, more money, more authority so we can get it further wrong next time. That's another problem. But nonetheless, they've at least admitted they got it wrong and we got it right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So anyways, let's keep going. Enough of uh, the boasting in church. That's not... Lord, forgive me for this moment of vanity. He says, in broad daylight and publicly defend your just cause. Wait patiently for the Lord. Wait confidently for him. Do not fret over the apparent success of a sinner. A man who carries out wicked schemes. Do not be angry and frustrated. Do not fret. Don't be agitated. That only leads to what? <laughs> Trouble. How many reacted in anger and goes, ooh, I really wish I hadn't done that. Have you done that? Yeah, I, I have done that, believe me. Verse 9, wicked men will be wiped out, but those who rely on the Lord are the ones who will possess the what? The land. They're the ones who possess the land. What is the land? Well, when David's writing this, he's talking about the, the kingdom borders and those who stay settled, those who rely on the Lord, those who trust the Lord, who commit themselves to prayer, who are delighting in the Lord, they're, they're maintaining their integrity, they're working through the chaos that's here, they're going to be, they're going to inherit this, what, this land of Israel, they're going to be a part of the inheritance of the blessed land. Well, what is the blessed land? Why did God give Israel this land? He declared it to be sacred space on all the earth because it would be a place where his presence would dwell temporarily because the real sacred space which was the garden of eden had been desecrated by the serpent and so to give hope to humanity he raised up a nation that would bear his presence and give hope to future generations that god would once again dwell among men so to inherit the land is more than just a promise to the Israelites in David's day. It's a promise that one day King Jesus is coming back and he owns it all and you'll have a place in that community. Yeah. Is that awesome? Yeah. That's the promise that's here. If you're faithful to put your roots down right where God has called you to put them down. That's what he's saying. And then he goes on to say, Wicked men will be wiped out, but those who rely on the Lord are the ones who will possess the land. Verse 10, evil men will soon disappear. You will stare at the spot where they once were, but they will be gone. But the oppressed will possess the land and enjoy great prosperity. The great prosperity of the Lord. You will enjoy it. There will come a day when the wicked and evildoers will be defeated. And there will be a rebirth of freedom and liberty and joy and righteousness and truth and love and beauty again. But it won't happen if the people of God don't speak up or run away. They have to plant their feet and stand by their convictions and live lives of integrity and righteousness and trust God to bless them and raise them up and make them a light right where they are. There's a great opportunity for us as Christians the principle is this, since the Lord can be trusted, we should not fret or become agitated. Trust him. Number two, I said there's four things. Here's number two. The Lord understands our situation and will act on our behalf. So we, we lean on him for strength when we are attacked. You're going to be attacked. You stand up for righteousness. You stand up for truth. You say, no, you're not doing that. No, you're not giving you know, puberty blockers to my kid. No, you're not castrating my son. No, you're not chest binding my daughter. No, we're not going to put up with this stuff in the school. No, I don't want, no, you don't have a right to have a special little deal with my kid without telling me. No, 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 that's not happening. No groomers on our team. You have to speak up for that stuff. And well, then you're going to be attacked. After the sermon, I'm probably going to be attacked, but I don't care. Evil men plot against the godly and viciously attack them. They don't attack the ungodly. They're already on the team. They're going after the guys that are saying, no, this isn't right. Have we lost our mind? We're going crazy. Those are the guys that get attacked. The Lord laughs in disgust at them. I thought, man, someday I need to do a sermon on what makes the Lord laugh. Would that be a great sermon? I'll talk about that sometime. But here, <laughs> it's not how you want them laughing. Right? The Lord laughs in disgust at them, for he knows their day is coming. In other words, God's going, oh, man. Yeah, keep it up. Keep it up. I got some plans for you, my friend. 
Yeah. People don't like to see that God is also a righteous judge. They always like the loving grandfather with the long beard and white hair. They don't like the righteous one who is a warrior, who God says in the book of Exodus, I am a man of war. And Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Oh, what happened to that, Jesus? The guy with the whips, whipping everybody in the temple and kicking them out and flipping over the tables, it says. What happened to that, Jesus? How come no one talks about that, Jesus? Just saying. So what does he say? Evil men draw their swords and prepare their bows to bring down the oppressed and needy and to slaughter those who are godly. I mean, they're aiming. They're going to take out the person that's trying to do the right thing. They're, they've got everything ready. They've got, they're locked and loaded. That's what it says. But remember, God's laughing. Why? Look at the next verse. Their swords will pierce their own hearts and their bows will be broken. God has this habit of what is known to theologians as redemptive redemptive uh, reversals. That you have a guy like Haman, he's going to hang all the Jews, right? And then he hangs on the gallows that he built. If you go out throughout the Bible, you see this pattern is consistent. You think of, the, think of the example of Moses, his wife dies, so he marries an Ethiopian woman, which means what? Very dark-skinned black woman. Well, his sister and brother, Miriam and Aaron, are angry because they're bigoted towards her. And so the sister of Moses starts complaining and saying, hey, he's not the only guy that can speak for God. We kind of get it. And he starts, she just basically starts gossiping because she's mad that he married this girl and that she was black. And so Aaron, who's not dumb, says, oh, this is big trouble. I better go talk to Moses. And so he says, uh, God's mad at Miriam. And Moses basically says, this is my interpretation of the conversation, but essentially, uh, why would you say that? Uh, because God turned her white. Yeah, the curse on Miriam was you don't like Moses' wife being black because you're brown? No, oh, I'm going to make you white. So he turns her white. So Aaron says, could you talk to God on our behalf and see if we could kind of get this thing reversed? And so Moses does, and God says Moses was what? The meekest man on the face of the earth. What does that mean? That means he wasn't mad and angry and starts yelling, what are you doing criticizing my wife? Who do you think you are? Man, you've always been a pain, little sister. I can't believe you're going off like this. You're driving me nuts. You don't talk to my wife like that. You can't come over for Thanksgiving anymore. That's it. Passover, out for you. He didn't do any of that. He just trusted God, conducted himself righteously, and let God deal with it. And that's how God dealt with that whole situation. And that's what? Their own swords will pierce their hearts and their bows will be broken. Verse 16, the little bit and a godly man owns, the little bit that a godly man owns is better than the wealth of many men. For evil men will lose their power, but the Lord sustains. And the word literally means props up. It's like God kind of props you up. He's lifting you up. He's got like, there's wind under your wings. God is providing that for you. He props up the godly. The Lord watches over the innocent day by day, and they possess a permanent inheritance. You inherit eternal life. It's a permanent inheritance. They will not be ashamed when hard times come. When famine comes, they will have enough to eat. Even though they don't have all the money in the world, they'll have plenty. They'll be fine. God will look after them. He will keep them going. They're going to be all right. Verse 20, but evil men will die. The Lord's enemies will be incinerated. They will go up in smoke. So his whole point is the second thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that since God understands our situation and is going to act on our behalf, we can lean on him. He will prop us up and give us strength when we're attacked and when we're going through hard times. So here's the principle. Since the Lord understands our situation, we should not fear. When we're frustrated, don't fret. When things are tough, don't fear. Number three, our Lord blesses and protects those who obey him. So obey the Lord's word faithfully. God wants to bless your life, but he can't if you're disobedient. So obey him. Verses 21 to 31, evil men borrow, but don't pay back their debt. That's how they steal. Hey, can I borrow that? Then they never give it back. They effectively stole it. That's what evil people do. They go, oh, yeah, you gave it to me. I'm just going to keep it. And, you know, you're going to have to bug me 400 times. and You'll finally get it back. But, you know, I know you'll give up, so I'll just keep it. That's what evil people do. That's what unrighteous people do. That's what he's saying. They borrow, they never pay it back. They don't plan to pay it back. They're not going to pay it back. But the godly show what? Compassion and are generous. 
They, a, a godly person is eager to, to share whatever they have. So when the crisis comes in the nation, remember this is the context that, that Dave is talking about, he goes, be generous with one another. Be open-handed with one another. God will take care of you. If you're trusting in the Lord, he's going to take care of you. You don't have to buy everybody, as one of our elders said, an annuity for the rest of their life. But you can afford a meal. We can help out here and there, can't we? And that's what he's talking about. Surely those favored by the Lord will possess the land, but those rejected by him will be wiped out. So we don't have to fret. We don't have to worry. We don't have to get angry. We don't have to be fearful. We can, we can trust the Lord. Just obey the Lord. Live out your Christian faith with integrity. The Lord grants success to the one whose behavior he finds commendable. When you do the things that please the Lord, he gives success to your life. Why are things going so well for you? I don't know. I'm just trying to obey the Lord. And he's working all the deals behind the scenes. I wake up and I got another deal on my hand. I don't know what happened. I'm just trying to be faithful with what I got. Verse 24. Even if he trips, he will not fall headlong. In other words, it won't be a deadly stumble. For the Lord holds his hand. It's like right out of heaven. Bink. Like, wow. The Lord saved him. Because the Lord's looking out after him and he knows everything that's going on. And he's holding your hand whether you realize it or not. He is a good father who watches over his children. Verse 25, I was once young, now I'm old. Remember, so this is the whole context. I've seen, this whole, I've seen this whole movie before. So everything I'm telling you, you can trust me. Because I've seen the patterns. I see how it works out. I know how these things work. I've lived it. And then he goes on to say, for the Lord holds his hand. I have never seen a godly man abandoned or his children forced to search for food. Now some of you go, I know someone who's poor had to search for food. Yeah, but not for their whole life. I was poor. I used to dumpster dive for food. I would look for those rotisserie chickens at Ralph's that were expired, and they'd throw them in the trash, and at night I'd sneak in and steal them and eat them out of the trash can because we were poor. But I don't do that anymore. Why? Because God has blessed me. I don't have to live like that anymore. When you live your life according to the way God wants you to live, eventually everything's going to work out fine. It doesn't all get worked out in one day. God has purposes for these trials and these things that go through your life. And he's working through them. Trust him. Rely on him. Believe in him. Walk obediently before him. Maintain your integrity. Stand up for him. Speak up for righteousness. Share whatever you have. Don't be like Gollum. You know, I, I, I get my rotisserie chicken. My brother says, can I have some? No, it's mine. No, you share. You share. You know, Gollum doesn't share, but that's, he's a bad example, right? So he says in verse 26, all day long he shows compassion and lends to others and his children are blessed. You just, you're not greedy. You're not selfish. You're, you're helpful. This talks about the importance of community, about the nation pulling together and mutually supporting themselves and creating a web of interconnectedness that they'll look after each other because they're all in the same family and they're all serving the same God and they have the same ambitions and they want to maintain a community of righteousness and they want to be with people who, can, who have the same virtues and the same values in their life and they want to build relationships with those as a priority relationships in their life. They see those people as valuable. They're not trying to impress other people. They don't want to be celebrities. They're not trying to get their name on Instagram with the most likes that they can possibly get they're actually after real quality relationships with other people and so they live this kind of life that's the picture we have here we're going to talk about that at the end of this message and what this all means so turn away from evil and do what is right then then you will enjoy lasting security for your lord promotes justice and never abandons his faithful followers they are permanently secure but the children of evil men are wiped out the godly will possess the land and will dwell in it permanently. We have this reiterated promise that God, who owns the earth, has a place for his people always, and that will be part of their inheritance, that there is a future and there is a hope always for those who walk with God. Verse 30, the godly speak wise words and promote justice. And here's the key. The law of their God controls their thinking. Did you get that? The law of of God controls or regulates their thinking. In other words, they have a biblical worldview and they interpret all reality through this film or this lens of a biblical worldview. And then they're able to make decisions that are consistent with that. How do I know there aren't 62 genders? Because it says in the Bible that God made them man and woman. That's how I know. How do I know? Am I bigot? No, I have a biblical worldview. Does that make sense? Yes. I don't cheat on my wife. Why? 
even if I could get away with it, because there's a biblical worldview that says thou shalt not commit adultery. So you don't, right? A biblical worldview means that you have a comprehensive understanding of all reality as it is filtered through the lens of God's truth. That's what he's saying here. That the person who is successful and has God's blessings in his life is the person who takes the law of God, the word of God, and allows it to control how they think. That's how we know affirmative action is evil. Because it is what? It's discrimination based on skin color. It's institutionalized racism. You say, well, no, you can't say that. You know, that's not right. We're trying. No, it is right. A biblical worldview says do not favor the poor because they're poor and do not give preference to the rich because they're rich, but treat all men justly. Amen. That's the biblical worldview. Oh. And so when you begin to live a biblical worldview, you know how to respond in certain situations. You, and then you do what? You say, who should I vote for? Well, take a look at their platform and see how it stacks up with a biblical worldview. If they're pro-abortion, pro-groomers, pro all this craziness in the culture, you probably don't want to be voting for that person or party. How hard is that to figure out? Unless, of course, you're going to deny God's word. The law of God is not the filter through which you evaluate all reality. But this is what he's saying. It's the law of God that controls their thinking. Their feet do not slip. What does that mean? And so they stand on solid ground. They are safe where they planted it. No, we're not doing that. Why? God says not to. Well, you're an idiot. That's fine. I just agree with God. We'll see how this plans out in the end. Well, let's just see how this pans out. How's that going for you? We'll see. Principle. Since God blesses his obedient children, we should not envy, that means be frustrated, because I don't have what another person has. We should not covet, which means I have a consuming desire to take what belongs to another and for myself. Or be jealous, that means be angry and resentful that another person has what I think should be mine. He says there's no, re there's no reason for the person who is living a biblical lifestyle and interprets all reality through the lens of God's word to ever have an, uh, feelings of envy or covetousness or jealousness because God's going to bless you. Why would you need to steal things that aren't yours if God's going to give it to you freely when you just live according to his word? John, uh, James 1.17 puts it this way. Every good thing comes from God. Every perfect gift is from him. These good gifts come down from the Father who made all the lights in the sky. But God never changes like the shadows from those lights. He is always the same. What is that? He is always the same. If God blesses every good thing in our life, and he gives those blessings to people who, what? Train their mind to think biblically. Think according to his law. Remember, why did God give his law? A lot of reasons. And one of the reasons is to promote human flourishing. You live your life like this, and you're going to be successful and happy. This is the whole point. And if you do that, the natural result is that God blesses you consistent with the promise because God never changes. He's always the same. You don't have to worry about it. And then I said, there's four things. Here's the fourth. And look, at I have nine minutes left. See, you, whoa, ye of little faith. Our, our Lord judges the wicked and rescues those who seek him. So how do I respond? So seek the Lord and rely on his protection, verses 32 to 40. Evil men set an ambush for the godly and try to kill them. But the Lord does not surrender the godly or allow them to be condemned in a court of law. What? Yeah, if you're living righteously... According to the biblical standard, you're doing the right thing. God will vindicate you in the end, even in the court of law. Now, if you're cheating on your taxes and complaining, well, we got 87,000 new guys coming after you. <laughs> Apparently with guns. Oh, man, should I tell this story? Yeah. yeah, I'll tell the story. I was riding bikes with a friend of mine who, you know, I, I, we're not like best friends, but we're decent friends, and he, he a great guy. And, it, uh, and basically for his career, he worked with the Defense Intelligence Agency, and a lot of different uh, army intelligence stuff. And I asked him the other day when we were riding the bike, I said, hey, do you stay, still stay in contact with your uh, in, you know, intelligence guys? Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, uh, some things happened this last week that I'm just a little conf confused about, so I want to make sure I'm accurate, I'm not getting this wrong. And he goes, oh, yeah, lay it on me, what do you think? I said, okay, here, here, here's, I think I heard this. 
that there is a shortage of ammunition because the IRS is buying millions and millions and millions of rounds of ammunition. So it's really hard to buy ammunition for your guns. And that yesterday it came out that they just passed a bill that said they're going to institute 87,000 new IRS agents and they're going to train them in how to uh, use firearms. Am I putting these dots together correctly or am I just a conspiracy nut? Okay. Here's what he said. Yeah, it's been known in the intelligence agency for a long time. They've been buying these bullets because they don't want the citizens to have them. They're just buying them up. But the crazy thing was it was the IRS that was buying them up and no one could figure it out and now we know why. That's from a guy who's in the spy business. This is a little scary. But you don't have to worry. Because you're going to obey the law, right? You're going to obey God's law. You're going to do the right thing. But don't be dopey. Don't take chances. If it's a gray area, back off the line. Before the rule of thumb was, well, it's a gray area. You know, move as close to the line as you can get. If you're wrong, you pay a little more taxes. Don't worry about it. Now, you might want to just say, they can have a few of those deductions. I don't care. I'd rather live than have that happen. I'm not saying they're going to kill you. I'm just saying Talk to an intelligence guy. A little scary things. There are scary things going on in our country right now. Well, enough for that. Pleasant thought. <laughs> Notice what he says. He says that God will make sure that we're going to be okay. We're not going to be condemned in a court of law if we keep our life according to his word. Rely on the Lord. Obey his commands. Then he will permit you to possess the land and you will see the demise of evil men. Just hang in there. Do the right thing. Have integrity. Trust the Lord. Walk with him. Commit your way to him. He'll get you through this crazy time. We are Christians. Our outlook is not about how we can manage the political system. We will be active in the system, but our faith isn't in the system. Our faith is in God. And our faith isn't in our political action, even though we will take political action. Our faith is in our Lord. He is the one that will protect us. He is the one that will raise up our voices. He is the one that will give us favor. He was the one that allow us to have influence. And if there will be a turnaround in this country, he is the one that will cause it, working through his faithful servants. Our trust and our reliance and our whole focus of our life is on the Lord first. Does that make sense? I don't want us to lose sight of these political things, which are super important, but they're outgrowths of what we believe and who we trust and what our life is really about. We're not a political organization. We're a religious organization. And because we're a religious organization, it covers every part of life, including politics. Okay? So that's what we're saying. Verse 34, rely on the Lord, obey his commands. He'll permit you to possess the land and you will see the demise of evil men. I have seen ruthless evil men growing in influence like green tree grows in its native soil. But then one passes by and suddenly they have disappeared. I looked for them. But I could not, they could not be found. Take note of the one who has integrity. Look for the person who says they believe it. They actually live what they believe. They don't compromise. They're not the guy that says, yeah, what Disney do is terrible, and then they go to Disneyland. You don't want to be that guy. You want to have integrity. You're going to make a stand. You're going to live by your stand. This is kind of stuff. That's what it's talking about, right? And then he says this, I've seen the evil men. Okay, what, what verse are we in? 37. Take note of the one who has integrity. Observe the upright for the one who promotes peace. And this is the word shalom, flourishing, has a future. The one who promotes shalom, the one who promotes flourishing in the culture by addressing the evil, cultivating the good, standing for righteousness and speaking out for the justness and the righteousness and of God's law and lives their life filtered by God's law, that person will be rewarded and have a great future. Verse 38, sinful rebels are totally destroyed. Evil men have no future. Ask Stalin, ask Mussolini, ask Adolf Hitler, ask Chairman Mao. Do I need to keep going down the list? They have no future. They're despised. How many of you guys have named your kid Adolf Hitler or so-and-so? <laughs> right? You don't even name your dog that. They're despised. In the end, God reveals the truth about all of us. Verse 39, but the Lord delivers the godly. He protects them in midst of trouble. The Lord helps them and rescues them. He rescues them from the evil men and delivers them for they seek his what? Protection. 
They don't take their vindication and justification into their own hands. They trust the Lord to work on their behalf as they live lives of integrity and obedience to his word. So here's the principle. Since the Lord judges the wicked and rescues the righteous, we should never seek vengeance. We don't have to. We don't have to make them pay. God will do that. Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. We saw two movies on at the movies on this, right? This whole idea. Do we take vengeance? How do we deal with it? Does God make things right? We saw that in the uh, Italian job and in uh, Monte Cristo movie. This is the principle. Don't let, otherwise what happens? It consumes you, it destroys you, and in the end it's not satisfying anyways. Let God deal with it, but trust him. So I have some final thoughts, and we'll wrap it up with this in my minute and 56 seconds that are left. It might take more. Notice that as you look at this psalm, all 40 verses, and it's a miracle we got through 40, isn't it? Yes. Praise the Lord. The believer's resource in times of chaos is repeatedly said to be in the Lord. So this tells me immediately as I evaluate my own behavior in this chaotic time, am I going to the Lord first or am I spazzing out and then mournfully, ashamedly, tail between my legs like, say, uh, Lord, I kind of got ahead of myself on that one. And I think we're all tended to do that. It depends on our temperament, right? But we have that tendency to do that. So what we want to do is, no, we want to go to the Lord. This whole psalm repeatedly says, take it to the Lord, take it to the Lord, trust the Lord, trust the Lord. I'm an old man. I see how this works out. Trust me. That's what David's saying. That's what he's saying to us. And so here's the bottom line. The point of this psalm, and perhaps the point of the entire Bible, and certainly the point of Christianity and Christian faith, is that as believers, we respond to crisis differently than the rest of the world. Our hope, our faith, our trust, and our emotional stability is completely rooted in our relationship with the Lord. This means, and this is an aha for me, a big one, this means that the ultimate problem confronting our nation is the spiritual health of Christians. Oh, shoot. We need to be rock solid in our relationship with Jesus Christ. There needs to be integrity in our lives. We need to closely represent what we claim to believe. We need to be passionate about the things of God. We need to stop taking the easy way out and trust the Lord, plant our feet, and live a life that filters everything through the truth of God's Word. That means that each one of our lives needs to be made right with God. No sin can be tolerated. And we need to start living the virtues we claim to believe in. Then we must lead our families in the same manner so that they might know, love, and obey God who's revealed himself in both nature and in the scriptures. And our church must do the same. We must be a people of the book, a people committed to the word of God, evaluating and looking at all of life and every issue through the lens of the word of God. That's what I'm trying to do. I hope it's helpful for you, but that's what we have to do. We have to look. What does the scripture say about this and about that? That's how we need to live our life. That's how our church needs to move forward. And that's who we need to be as a people of God. And if we are to return our nation to its foundational virtues, then we must return to the laws of nature and nature's God. Individually, we must do it. Personally, in our personal conversations, we must do it. Courageously, we must do it. It's not going to happen if no one says anything for fear of offending someone. Say it in love, but say it. Speaking the truth in love. The two go hand in hand. If you tell the truth without love, you're just beating people up. If you love people without telling them the truth, you're leading them off the cliff to death and perdition. Neither one is virtuous. Both are evil. Speaking the truth in love. You must do both. And with this courage, we need to act both interpersonally, socially, culturally, and politically as individuals, and as a church congregation. Because there's a life principle at stake, and here it is. Belief without action only produces inoculation, not transformation. Your heart just grows harder. You become more and more the inauthentic Christian, the guy that has all the platitudes and no, no change in your life. You look just like the same clown that you were 10 years ago. There's no difference. You're just harder, and nothing moves your heart, nothing moves your soul. 
you've lost the compassionate heart of Jesus because you've be, been around the truth so long and done nothing with it. And you just have layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of self-deception and hardness and coldness of heart. If that's where you're at, repent. Repentance isn't a bad word. It just says tell God the truth about how you screwed it up and that you need his help to be different going forward. It's like the best news in the world, repentance. Because on God's side, it's quick forgiveness. What does he say? He's slow to anger and quick to forgive, abounding in loving kindness and truth. Right? Come boldly to the throne of grace to receive mercy, to find grace and, and help in time of need. God wants to give it to you. You just have to admit, I screwed that one up big time. Let me tell you all the ways, Lord. And then he'll usually go, nah, you forgot this and this too. Yeah, yeah, that was right too. <laughs> Missed that one also. That's how hard and far off I've been. And then he's merciful and gracious and he restores those who come. If we do these things recorded in this psalm, with our heart reliably fixed on God, we have the encouragement from God's word in this psalm that he will take care of us and eventually give us success. Isn't that good news? So that means there's hope for our lives and there's hope for our nation. But we have to be the agents of change. We have to be the ones whose lives are in alignment with God and his truth. We have to be the lights that shine in the dark world. We have to be the ones who speak up for truth and righteousness. We have to be the ones that pay the price that God might reward us in the future because it will be costly. That their life of holiness is never cheap, but it's worth every single penny it costs. And that's what we want to do and be. And so finally, I want to close with this. This is why we're starting this ministry called the 654 Fellowship Meals and why they're so important. There's something probably in your bulletin about them. There's 654 groups. It means six-ish people getting together for five weeks. And what are they going to do? Well, they're going to have four weekly practices. They're going to share a meal together. Who's in favor of that? Yeah, yeah. especially if the person knows how to cook. Uh, secondly, share your testimony together to become known. Get to know each other. Remember I told you, we have to be a community of God's people. We have to be integrated with other people who have the same values, the same virtues, the same God, the same perspective on life, and the same goals and ambitions for their families. We have to be in a community, and this will strengthen us. This is how the communists in Czechoslovakia were able to, the, the, the Christians in Czechoslovakia were able to survive the communist oppression and the actual targeting, the targeting of Christians. There became the underground church because they had this network of fellowships where they would meet together with people they could trust. They would share their resources and they would love on each other and they would encourage and motivate and inspire and watch each other's kids and do what they could to help each other get along even as the government was targeting them and trying to destroy them. Super important that we have a network like that in our church. And so we share a meal, we share our testimony, we share our lives during group discussions and finally we share our burdens through prayer. And it's only five-week commitment. You say, I'm not a fit for that group. They're all smarter than me. Then we say, well, that's very wise. We'll put you in another group of dumber people. <laughs> Just being, adding a little humor to the message. No, we'll find a fit for you. The whole point is, we'll find a fit for you. You're not, you're not burdened for life to the same group if it's, not a, if it's not a fit. We want it to fit. And we understand not all fits work. I have a, no, I won't get it. Come to the pastor's coffee. I'll give you more information on my theories and all that. Okay, and then finally, you share your burdens through prayer. Say, I'm struggling with this. I need help with this. I, want to, I need prayer for this. And that's it. That's the whole thing. Six-ish people. That means you might have seven if someone's single in the group or something like that or eight at the most. Five-week commitment, and then you can recirculate. You say, yeah, everyone in my group's awesome. We want to do it again. Then do it. You say, I'd like to meet some new people. Then do it. You say, I don't fit. Okay, we'll find a new fit. That's the idea. And then these four weekly practices. That's why we're doing that. Number two, this is why we're partnershiping with PTUSA Faith. I just got back from the pastor's conference last week. It was tremendous and unbelievable. I mean, there was so much good stuff, I couldn't take it all in. My mind just like semi-exploded two-thirds of the way through with really, really great stuff, and I'll be talking more about that in the future. And that's also why we're bringing in Brandon Tatum to speak to us in two weeks. He's part of the PTUSA squad. He's also part of Salem Broadcasting Network. He's also a really strong Christian. He also is a dynamic preacher. He's also a, an amazing former cop, and he has unbelievable stories to tell with that. And I think you'll be really inspired and encouraged by that. And that's in two weeks. And that's also why, finally, our mission is to help people find Christ and grow. This is the ultimate. We're making disciples of the nation by one individual at a time, correct? We're here to help them find eternal life, 
to give them hope that can only come from the gospel of Jesus Christ. We care about their soul more than we care about anything else. That is why we share our faith. And that is why we strengthen families, because families are the units in which a healthy society is birthed. And if there's a healthy society in the family, they can actually share the light of the gospel more easily because everybody says it's really hard to have a good family and you've pulled it off. I want one like yours. And you say, well, that's easy. Just get to know my God. His name is Jesus Christ. And this is how the two work hand in hand. And that's why we what? We celebrate and we secure our God-entrusted freedoms. Because if we are not free to share our faith and share our families, then what do we have in terms of accomplishing the mission that our commander has given to us to go and make disciples of all peoples, every nation on the planet? We need that freedom. God said that he is the author of liberty and freedom, that where the spirit of the risen Christ is, there's always hope, and that where the spirit of Christ is, there is liberty. God has given that to us. That is our heritage. But it will be taken from us because there are evil spirits in this world who embody individuals who want to take that from us because their religion is a different worldview. But it touches on every single thing that our religion touches on. And it is the exact opposite of it all because he is the opponent, he is the evil one who rebelled against God in the beginning and is continuing to try to undo all the good that God has done in this world around us. And our job is called to fight him every step of the way till Jesus gets back. And we'll have some victories and we'll have some losses. But in the end, King Jesus will reign supreme and we will be rewarded for our faithfulness. And that's my encouragement to you. Go forward faithfully in courage to walk and serve the Lord together. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you that you love us. We thank you for this beautiful psalm. Something great to think about throughout the week. I pray that it would give us strength and nourish our souls as we contemplate it and think about it this coming week and try to implement it into our lives. Most importantly, Lord, help us to remember that the battle that's in front of us isn't a political one. It's not a financial one. It's not a cultural one. It is a spiritual one. But I don't mean that in just ethereal terms. I mean in practical terms. That it all begins by getting our own personal life squared away with you on every issue that we have ignored or allowed to slip through our fingers. Help us, Lord, to be those men and women of integrity that you will bless. Teach us to see and view the world through the lens of Scripture, your word. Help us to take action when called upon, to speak up for you. Give us wisdom to know how to act and when to act. And then give us the courage to act on the things we know you're calling us to do. For I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.